Hello, everyone. It is always my pleasure to bring to this space someone who has done a lot and continues to do a lot to make our world a better place. And for today, there is no better person to bring here and have a conversation with than uh, Mr. Mike Ballis, who is a very special person to me personally. Uh, Mr. Ballis is a credentialed alcoholism and substance abuse counselor, uh, holds a bachelor's degree in business administration and a master of social work degree uh, from Adelphi University. And uh, he has occupied many roles in, uh, especially in substance uh, use uh, disorders. Uh, he was the clinical director of Arms Acres Hospital and Healthcare System and uh, the agency director uh, for the Council on Alcoholism Prevention and Education of Dutchess County in New York. And very shortly, he is going to be the chief clinical director uh, at Step One. And uh, so, Mr. Ballet, you don't mind if I just say Mike, right? <laughs> we have come uh, quite a long way, haven't we? Yes, we have. Yes, we have. Absolutely. So, how has life been? Life, is, life has been a, a very uh, interesting roller coaster of events. That's what life has been, but uh, <laughs> definitely uh, uh, enjoyable in the overall. Um, you know, I'm really, uh, I'm really grateful for the experiences that I've had, and uh, to be where I'm at, and uh, have have the hopes and aspirations that I have moving forward. You know, I, I can never tell you enough how proud of you I am, and uh, you have done a tremendous job for our field, and you continue to do this work. And every time I turn around, you're doing another big thing. And uh, so I am incredibly proud of you. I have told you that many times. And now sure. I want uh, more people from all over the world <laughs> to, to hear it. Uh, so I just said that very soon you are going to become uh, the clinical, the chief clinical director uh, at Step One. Uh, introduce us to step one and tell us about the role that you are going to occupy. Sure. Um, so step one is a uh, treatment facility for substance use disorder as well as mental health. Um, there are three substance use treatment facilities. There are outpatients as well as three uh, mental health outpatients as well. So they'll be providing uh, counseling services. And, um, you know, we also have uh, Hudson River Housing in uh, Poughkeepsie, as well as the Pods, which is, uh, you know, we're homeless for homeless shelter, so to speak. Um, and then 12 other locations that are like satellite locations that are providing uh, services, uh, whether mental health or uh, substance use, as well as traumatic brain injury. Uh, so it's a, it's a big role for me to go into. Uh, I'm very happy and grateful to be going into this role. Uh, it's 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 on that path that I I've always kind of saw myself going in in a, in a direction, um, try to try to climb the ladder as much as possible, so to speak, so that I have the ability to make some change, some real change, um, and make some decisions on the way and and uh, affect as many people as possible in the roles that I'm in to try and improve the quality of care, uh, to try and improve the outcomes that we, we look for for the population that we serve and, and uh, really do as much as we can to affect the, the community in a positive manner. And uh, to go back from prevention to treatment again is, is kind of, uh, you know, a passion of mine. And, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm happy to be doing that, but I'm, I'm really grateful to be part of an agency. Step One is a great agency. It's been around for a long time. You and I have a few things in common, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and one of them is really what drives us uh, to make an impact, uh, to change the world that we live in, you know, one person, one system at a time, uh, to make it better for everyone. And in doing that, we enjoy engage in communities because we know that that's what that's how it needs to be done we are part of community 
And we need to not only be involved, uh, but also to really participate and uh, create change in those communities. Uh, and so sometimes I ask myself, are you already, is it something that's already in you, that this is the kind of person you are, the kind of person who likes to just make the world a better place? Or is it your education that did that to you? I think um, I think I was already that. Uh, that that kind of existed in me for for quite some time. Uh, it took me a long time, you know, as younger, you know, to really find what that was. Uh, but I've always I've always had in me that that want to, you know, help others to to make you know to make things better. Uh, even though you know my early life probably didn't always go that way. Um, you know, as you're familiar with, I've, I'm someone who's probably lived two, maybe three lives in one, even at, a, even at this age. But um, I think that making the decision to go and, and attain my social work degree and, um, you know, eventually the LMSW and the LCSW, which I have, uh, those, those were kind of things that I needed to be able to carry out what I already felt inside what I wanted to do. Uh, it gave me the validity in the world um, so that people would take me seriously. And, um, you know, obviously the education really helped me further understand what the needs were and be able to identify those gaps in services and, and how to really be able to attack those things uh, to make a difference, to make a change. So, um, but the, definitely the seed was already there. It was just a matter of, of uh, individuals like yourself, you know, playing a part and learning to, to water that seed to help it grow. You know, let me just say that someone that I I, mean, I know you know, uh, Angelina Rhodes just said, uh, so proud of you, Michael. And uh, I said also, it's that was the best decision ever. And I think that by writing that uh, message, she has also echoed uh, what I have in mind, that the profession is lucky to have you. And the communities that you serve are also fortunate to have you and uh, all of us that know you as well. And it also really speaks to the old uh, thing, the old um, saying, our leaders born or are they made? Because I'm not sure that any classroom education could have transformed you in the way that um, you are. And uh, and also with the kind of work that you do and how much of it you've done. Uh, but when did you know that working in the addiction arena uh, will become your career uh, direction? Um, it's interesting because you know to you know to reveal for anyone who doesn't know because I'm very open about my own history. I'm a person in long term recovery myself, and uh, you know so I have over 20, 20 years, I actually have 21 years next month, uh, about a month from the fourth, so a month from Thursday. And um, I think early on um, in my recovery- If you don't mind, process, please, please explain, no? because there are people watching us too from what I can Sure. No, uh, no, no. They no may not be familiar with what recovery means. No, absolutely. So recovery for me, you know, I'm a person in uh, recovery from long-term uh, substance use, right? Um, so I have a, a history of substance use myself and, and being in recovery for me means that, you know, I've abstained from use of any mind or mood altering substances for over 20 years. So next month will be 21 years. And, you know, that has helped afford me to make some decisions in my life that were positive. Um, it, you know, substances used to be my coping mechanism for life. And uh, it's not any longer. And, and it's allowed me to use a lot of the energy and effort that I would put towards that part of my life and put it towards something a little bit more positive. And, you know, to kind of track back to the, the prior question is, you know, I, I, I think during my recovery process and early recovery, I always knew, you know, by going, you know, I, I do 12 step fellowship meetings and I'm not going to promote anything, but, you know, I've done that for a long time and uh, I do a lot of, you know, self-help and, and uh, you know, through that, 
and, and working with other individuals that are struggling to find their own recovery process or even during their own recovery process um, has been, you know, a sense of joy for me. Um, you know, I learned to, you know, not necessarily worry about my own well-being all the time or how well I was doing or or trying to do better than anybody. Uh, I really understood the the collective idea that if we're all doing well, then then life will be better for all, right? And that's that's kind of, you know, what social work is. And, um, you know, I think probably maybe about 10 years into my recovery process uh, is when I realized, you know what, I, I want to do this on a bigger scale than just this one-on-one -on -one and, um, you know, with people that I know or that I'm surrounded with, but uh, I want to find a way to affect change in a bigger, in a bigger way. And um, it's when I decided to go take the Clay, the KSAC course and, you know, affect, you know, see if I could be a counselor and, and help individuals who are struggling in treatment. And uh, through that, I, I realized, okay, now I want to do something bigger than that. And I guess that's kind of carried me throughout my career, if you've noticed, is like, <laughs> which is why I think I end up in positions for a certain period of time. And then the next, the next thing kind of shows up. Um, and I realize, you know what, that's, that can do something on a bigger scale again, I can do this on a bigger scale. And um, it's, it's really been that way for probably the past, I'd say about uh, 12 years overall. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I have no intentions of stopping anytime soon. <laughs> so, Right. So you know me. And so you will not, you will not argue with me if I, no. <laughs> I said I was, if I said I was a storyteller. And so I really do have remarkable um, respect for the power of stories. And so just telling that story about your recovery and how it uh, led you to this point uh, reminds me of that, the power of stories. And uh, someone, you know, Stephanie Jackson uh, wrote, for example, that she did not know about that history and wrote, uh, congratulations, my girl, I had no clue. <laughs> and uh, so, but just telling that story will actually also not reveal you more, uh, but also encourage more people uh, to really uh, understand that there is hope and that they can do those things. And, uh, you know, I like the fact that you also linked it with how you take care of yourself now. Um, and you take care of yourself to make sure also that you continue on that road. It, it, so why would you say I am in recovery? In, because you don't use any substances anymore and it's been over 20 years, but you still said I am in recovery. Sure. Not, um, I, not I have recovered or I over. Right. Um, I think that that's a, uh, I guess it's a debatable topic for some. Uh, for me, my own personal belief is that, you know, if I remove myself from the process, right, because for me, it's a process. So if I remove myself from the process of recovery, which means that I'm doing things to affect change in myself and I'm paying attention to my behaviors. I'm paying attention to the kind of person that I am and how I act towards others. Um, if I stop doing that for me, um, it changes who I am and it changes who I am to the degree that it puts me back in a place where I was when I was using substances, uh, where my, my thoughts are very selfish. Oh, my light turned off in my office, excuse me. Um, my thoughts become very selfish. Uh, my ability to care for others diminishes because my own needs or wants become primary to life. And, um, you know, it, everything revolves around whether it's a substance or it's, it's you know, uh, a desire of something, you know, that can always take my focus. And so, if I'm not in recovery then, and I've recovered, then my brain would never go back to that. But because that substance use disorder is a, is a brain disease, right? Uh, addiction is a brain disease. Um, it means that it, it constantly needs to be addressed and it constantly needs to be taken a look at. Um, and I can never say that I've, I've just recovered and I'm good, you know? Um, 
But I, I don't look at that as a negative thing. I look at that as a positive thing because I think there's a lot of people in this world that don't think there's anything wrong with them and they never think they're, they're wrong. <laughs> they always think they're right. They can never take a look at things. And um, I'd argue that I'm probably happier than they are at this point. And, uh, you know, I think that's a good thing. It allows me to continue to grow. Right. You know, when you were telling the story in response to my question about um, uh, recovery, you used the word uh, mind and mood altering. And so let me ask you, how do substances alter the mind and mood of the user? Oh. Um, so, I mean, it's interesting because I've been teaching, I've been teaching the course uh, myself. <laughs> so, um, you know, if, if you think about a key thing, right, in life, uh, what we all, and there's a there's a doctor who uh, who speaks on this in length, um, but uh, you know, dopamine, right? Dopamine is what we what we seek, right? And um, substances, usually illegal illegal illicit substances. I'm not talking about you know medications prescribed by your doctor, like for for depression, antidepressants, or or whatever the case is, like those things are to help, right? So I don't want to, I don't want to misconstrue because there are individuals who take it to that next level of, of uh, understanding, which, you know, I think is very something I would argue to be wrong. Um, but when you're talking about a substance that, for the specific reason of getting hot, right? For the specific reason of getting yourself out of yourself, right? To not feel whatever it is that you feel. Um, you're seeking dopamine and dopamine increases. Uh, you get so many different levels of dopamine. Uh, they call it uh, nanograms per deciliter, right? So you get, I think certain substances, you get like five, 600 nanograms per deciliter. Um, if you think about how many nanograms per deciliter you get from using a substance like cocaine, right? It's probably like five to six times that of what you would get, for example, from having sex, which we think, wow, like what a great feeling that could be, right? But a substance can do five to 10 times more than that, right? Um, that's pretty, that's pretty insane, right? And, uh, so when you think about it from that standpoint, it's pretty easy to understand why people are addicted, right? Because they feel that way. And, uh, you know, I I, uh, I feel like that's very important to pay attention to. Um, so that's why I say, you know, substances, you know, mind and mood altering, because it changes how you feel. You know, dopamine changes how you feel. It, it, it certainly makes you feel better in the moment, different, right? And uh, to the degree where the longer you use, the less dopamine you create, which means that you need to now get to a point where you need to use just to feel like a normal person, right? So when people are struggling to stop using, um, I think us as social workers or just people in general need to have that clear understanding that it's not that they're just choosing to get high any longer, it's a need at that point just to feel normal. And uh, it makes it a very different aspect to look at, a different perspective uh, for individuals to pay attention to. Right. So um, when you are just looking at someone who is using, <laughs> are you able to tell without a professional eye? For example, are family members and friends able to tell that a person has become physically and psychologically dependent? Uh, on substance use, and if so, what can they do? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, there's always signs and symptoms, right? Of any, like any disorder. Um, you know, I think that, and you can always tell. Well, when trained, you can tell when an individual is on a substance at that point in time, right? Um, what you can do, really. It's difficult, right? It, it varies because it's one of the few, it's one of the few disorders, and I say the few because it's not the only one. There are others out there that in your own mind, you can convince yourself that you don't have that disorder, right? You, you can convince yourself there's nothing wrong with you. 
that, you know, it's, it's everything else but that that's the problem. And so I say that because when you say, well, what can family members do? What can, what can loved ones that care about you, friends, whatever do? Um, sometimes that's a very difficult thing other than to provide support, other than to provide information, you know, educate, but also, you know, with the understanding that ultimately the individual themselves has to make that decision that they want help, right? You cannot force anybody to get help. And unfortunately, it's it's why the overdose rate is what it is. It's why we're losing so many individuals is because, you know, when someone becomes physically and, and you know, mentally addicted to a substance, you know, it's not a matter of just, hey, take this and you're good. It's a matter of like they need to understand like they're tired of living that way and, and want to make a change. But family members and loved ones really, you know, we need to be around to care to offer support, but also have the ability to set clear boundaries and understand that, you know, um, a lot of times individuals are going to act out in diseased behavior rather than the behavior of who they truly are. And so that means, you know, if we allow someone to take advantage, they will continue to take advantage. Doesn't mean they're a horrible person, but that means that that's what they're going through in order to feel uh, to get better for themselves because they're only seeing the solution as being to get high, not the solution as being, I need to stop getting high and get help, right? And so it's it's that tricky, you know, give and take, so to speak. Like I can be there for you emotionally. I can be there for you for support. I can offer you, uh, you know, a support to get you into a treatment program. I can offer you the education on what this is doing to you, but you know what? Like you stole from me, so... I can't have you living with me though, right? I can't give you any money because I can't trust that, you know, that money's going towards your needs. It's going to, it may go towards your substance. And I don't want to further help you kill yourself. So it, there's, there's really a tricky way of doing it, but, um, you know, there is ways to help. Right. I, I know that uh, you don't have an abundance of time, <laughs> you know, but That's I... Good. Right. So I like to ask at least one more question as far as mm -hmm. the clinical uh, aspect of this. Sure. Now, let's say clinical societal. What do you think the role of stigma is in this discussion as far as uh, addictions go? Mm -hmm. it's, it plays a tremendous role. Um, you know, I think that, I mean, just the very fact, I think I spoke about it before, is that there's so many um, opposing views on things, right? Uh, just the very idea that addiction is a disease would be something that would be argued by people, right? Many people think that it's a choice, that it's not a disease. Um, so stigma exists. It, it plays a role in individuals not wanting to seek treatment because then they feel that they're judged as being one of those negative uh, kind of tones that you would hear, you know, whether it be someone called a junkie or or something along those lines, right? Like nobody wants to be told that. Nobody wants to be, be viewed as that. But that is what many people in society will look at an individual who's struggling with substance use disorder. So, um, you know, it prevents individuals from getting treatment. It prevents people from being willing to say that they have a problem, even when they do. Um, there's cases where it, CPS is involved and and you know, women, uh, men, you know, mothers, you know, they, they don't want to acknowledge that they have an issue to seek help because they're afraid that their, their children are going to get taken away, right? Um, it just exists in so many different fashions, and uh, it has prevented a lot of things from moving in the right direction for a long time because it doesn't just exist in society and, like, you know, we can have a group of 10 people. There may be five of those that think that, you know, we need to help individuals. Others may say, well, it's their choice. You know, they, they made their own bed, let them sleep in it. But then you have policymakers who feel the same exact way. And that is tragic. Uh, but I, I have one question, you know, in relation to uh, what we've talked about as far as of what family members can do. Uh, I have a question here for you. The questions, the, they want you to talk about how family members can be supported. These family members of people who are addicted. How can oh, they sure. 
How can they be supported? Right. Um, Although someone has said Al-Anon, Al-Anon is supported. Right. There and is. Some of the yes. sessions that I've done for family members um, and um, the person in treatment. Right. They also, there, there has been an expansion in New York State uh, for OASIS, uh, which is the oversight agency for all the treatment facilities, um, that they have now extended services to family members. So um, there is the ability for family members to receive services from many of the treatment facilities to uh, be supportive of their family and also get the support that they need um, on their own well-being because you know, they call this a family disease because everyone within the family is affected by what happens with the disease, right? Whether it be the individual having argumentative relationships or, you know, just by having loss. I mean, if you think about how many individuals have passed from this disease, um, how many families are just left, you know, just with that trauma themselves and not knowing how to deal with things. Um, so there are groups, there's support groups, there are uh, treatment facilities offer some supports, um, mental health counseling, and, you know, just community, community groups. And I would, you know, the agency that I'm currently in before I leave, right, is, uh, you know, one of the things that we do is uh, we support two grassroots uh, coalitions. And one of the things that I would always encourage any family member who, you know, may have a difficult time getting through to their loved one or may have lost a loved one get involved, do community work, try to make a difference in the bigger scheme of things because that will help fill that void that you feel. And it also allows you to learn more about what the disease is and, and how to be able to, you know, address those feelings and those, those sorrow and that pain that you're dealing with uh, in, a, in a healthy manner and be able to help others as well at the same time. Right, there is a new question. Uh, what if they are still in denial? Who the individual or the family? Because both can occur. Correct, both. I'm sure there. Are, <laughs> I'm sure there are references to both. Sure, you know? <laughs> and, and that's kind of that's kind of what I spoke on earlier. Is that when an individual who's using the substance uh, is in denial, it is very difficult, and that's when I talked about boundaries being extremely important. Right, um, you know, as a family member or the loved one of the individual who's using. Um, you need to set clear boundaries, you know, you, you need to allow, you know, allow that individual to know that you love and care for them in a, in a positive and productive manner, while also not allowing them to take advantage, right? Um, you hear the term rock bottom quite often when you think about addiction, right? And individuals need to hit rock bottom. I don't necessarily believe in rock bottom, but I think that an individual has to experience the pain of not only wanting to stop using the substance, but understanding that the people who could love and care about them will be there for them mentally and emotionally supportive, but are not physically going to take care of them forever, right? And that's the important piece. Um, as far as families being in denial, I think the only thing we can do is educate them, you know, educate them on what this thing, what this looks like, and really use a little bit of empathy and compassion and understanding that, you know what, they may not understand or may still be in denial because there's probably a family history and they were taught to not look at it as a negative, right? Because if if my if my father was a drinker and he was an alcoholic growing up, but he didn't get any treatment, there was nothing wrong. We were told, don't talk about that outside of the house, right? So what happens is, is that now when I'm a parent and I have a child now that's using, right? I, I don't want to talk about it to anybody else because I was taught at a young age that this is embarrassing. We're not to talk about what's going on because it's negative. It'll be looked at negative by society. So we kind of in turn do the same thing, right? So education is always going to be important. So which comes first, a prevention or education? Both at the same time, quite honestly, because ed education is prevention, right? Um, you know, the, the agency that I'm in now, the Council on Addiction Prevention and Education, you know, what do we do and, and what I've done for over the last year um, is to educate at all ages, whether adult uh, or adolescent, right, and anywhere in between. Um, 
and educate on what the effects are of substances, what can occur, and speak facts, be able to provide statistics, and the importance of paying attention to those things, and how somebody can better make decisions for themselves without being told that they have to make those decisions, right? Because most individuals don't want to be told what you have to do, but if you're provided with the right information and factual evidence, uh, a lot of times people are going to make the best decision for themselves. That's usually how it works. You know, frequently we t when we talk about substance use and when we talk about the education aspect of it, uh, the tendency is to talk about educating young people, educating children, but uh, just listening to you, it seems like it shouldn't just be education that focuses on children not using it. Uh, it also means that everybody should be getting educated, children, adults, everybody should be getting educated about this. Absolutely. Absolutely. 100%. I mean, the reality is, is that, you know, uh, I think, you know, we were taught for a long time, uh, you know, if you look at all like the promotional you know, prevention things, right? It was like, just say no, or like crack an egg and this is your brain, this is your brain on drugs, you know, like things like that. And it was always fear tactic and, you know, it further induced the stigma that exists, right? But if we're educating all and we're educating young and older parents, whatever the case is, uh, it's a clear, consistent message that comes across all phases of life. Um, you're more likely to induce that change that you really want. Um, with the acceptance and understanding that the fact that there's going to still be individuals who end up having substance use disorder and we'll all be better equipped and prepared to address that and help and to be able to help those individuals to find recovery. I have a very important comment here, but I'll preface it by saying this, that uh, as you know, I... I'm developing a brand new social work program at my university from scratch. And what I decided to do was to create a program with specializations. And one of the specializations is mental health and substance use disorders, uh, because we both know that uh, very often they are comorbid. Uh, mm -hmm. there, are, there are so many, I mean, co-occurring uh, circumstances. So the question here, obviously from a social worker. It's not even a question. Uh, is uh, the, the point is to make sure that we are also educating on dual, dual diagnosis. And so I wonder if you will speak to that. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, I think that, you know, it's, it's, it's very important. I think I commend you for that because uh, I don't think there's a lot of schools that, that focus enough on these things. Um, you know, any individual that has a substance use disorder has experienced some level of trauma. We know that it's fact. Um, so that's a co-occurrence just in itself. Um, and then we also know that many individuals who have developed, you know, or, or have a mental health disorder have developed a substance use, right, disorder to be able to either self-medicate or whatever the case is, right? Um, how important it is that we have you know, more courses than just one, right? Um, just one course on substance use, you know, that's okay, it, it's great. However, um, how does that equip me as a social worker to go into the field where I'd say on average, even if I work in a mental health program, I would say probably 60 to 70% of the clients that I work with are also using substances, right? If I go into the substance use treatment field as a social worker. One, I'm probably not well equipped because I've only had one course in, in grad school, right? So what do I really know until I actually am there and, and can experience it? But not only that, if I go into that field, about 90% of the individuals with a substance use disorder also have a co-incurring mental health disorder, right? So these things are so intertwined that you know, it may, it only makes sense to have further education on them while you're in school, right? So we can be more well-equipped to be able to handle the individuals and be supportive of the individuals that we serve. You're absolutely right, because even when you look at a DSM and you're going to make a mental health diagnosis, 
the, DM, the DSM says, uh, basically, are you sure that this disorder you are diagnosing, these symptoms are not occurring uh, within the context of substances? So you that's well understood. Um, and I think that you're absolutely right that um, most social work schools do not really teach this. They need to be more focused on substance use disorders. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I had the opportunity to come and build a social work program the way that I think uh, social work programs should be built and how they should train. And um, it's, I think that my community, my state, and the students that will go through our social work program here at my university will be the better for it. And so will our profession. Uh, but the question that I have for you, knowing that um, you are also an adjunct professor uh, of social work and you teach this course, how do you think that it should be taught in social work programs? I think that there needs to be probably more than one, okay? Um, definitely more than one, I shouldn't say probably, because there should be absolutely a course just on prevention itself. Prevention and education of what substance use is, the different substances, um, the different levels of substance use disorder, whether mild, moderate, or severe, um, you know, the impact that it can have on families, um, and just just the education piece for you know youth and all age groups, as I had said, um, I think a course on just that alone is important, right? And then to have a course as well on assessing and treating substance use disorder for those who have already crossed that threshold beyond experimentation and to the point where they have developed a substance use disorder, because. There's so much to learn, right? Uh, substance use is is like a forever developing field, right? Um, if you talk about five years ago, who was talking about fentanyl, right? They were talking about opiates. They were talking about heroin, just, you know, beginning and talking about the the oxycodone and how the, the opioid epidemic was, was starting or had been existing for maybe a couple of years at that point. Um, and it just started to hit the headlines. Now everything's fentanyl, right? Everything's fentanyl. Now everybody knows what fentanyl is. But how many people know what xylazine is, right? Because that's fairly new. Um, it's not new, but it's new to what people are using, right? Um, how many people know about car fentanyl? How many people know about like other levels of things that have just recently come out, which are 10 times stronger than fentanyl, right? Because it's forever developing. Because when you're dealing with, you know, illegal trade, right, if we talk about it for what it is, anytime something is caught on to, they're developing something else to get over on, right? And so it's always going to develop. And if it's always developing, then we always have to revise and, and update and renew so that we are keeping up with the times. You can't do that if you're doing all of that in one course, it doesn't happen. <laughs> it doesn't happen. No, it doesn't, which is why in developing uh, the program here at my university. Uh, by the way, for anyone who is interested and would like to check us out, um, now speak to Mike or myself. I am at the University of Delaware. And in developing this program, I, of course, students, I said, they have the option to not specialize if they don't want to. But there are three specializations. One is children and families. Uh, the other is mental health and substance use disorders. And the last one is gerontology. And uh, for every one of those specializations, I have um, I, I have courses on substance use disorders as well. Um, because this runs across all levels and ages of society. And I want social work students to graduate from my university well prepared to work with any population and uh, you amaze me because you actually just run with it you i know that the one course that you had was not enough 
as you were invested in this because of your personal experience as well as the fact that you had cancer. And so you went in prepared and you have really risen uh, leaps and bounds in your career in administration. So what have been the lessons uh, for you as an administrator and clinician? Um, wow, I've had so many, quite honestly. Um, you know, I, I, I had to learn early on in my career to slow down because I, I didn't know how to do that. And uh, I, I still don't know how to do that very well, but I learned how to slow down a little bit, I guess. Um, but I think the most the most valuable thing to to that I've learned is, you know, understanding that you can get your point across without forcing it. And, you know, I, I've been in many situations where I've I've absorbed so much information. Um, I've had supervisors who just had a wealth of knowledge and um, I learned how to, you know, listen twice as much as I spoke, which is something that <clears throat> you learn in, in the recovery process, but also applies to this field. And, you know, I was able to absorb so much that when it became my time to actually be able to speak up and make some changes, um, it came from a place of knowledge and experience and understanding rather than just, you know, wanting to just do what I wanted to do. Um, you know, I'm grateful for my journey because I started, you know, when I when I graduated from my um, master's program, as you know, I, I went immediately into a clinical supervisor role. Um, but I also had a caseload and I've had a caseload pretty much throughout my career, even in director's positions up until this current role. Um, just because I always wanted to have my myself directly involved in the clinical aspect, right? To be able to work with individuals and help one-on-one. -on -one. And, um, you know, to be able to go from that clinical supervisor role in a methadone clinic to going to a mental health clinic and working in a pros program as a director and work with severe and persistent mental illness. Um, just having that wide variety of, of experience um, it really helped so much, you know, um, into some of the places where I think a lot of people would be hesitant to work in, right? Like a methadone clinic can be daunting for people, you know? Um, it was some of the best experience that I ever had, you know, going and working with individuals with for severe and persistent mental illness can be daunting. It was for me. It was for me. And a lot of that was because I had my own stigma. Like I had my own predisposed notion of what people were. And uh, what I realized is that, you know, these people, some of these people are like the best people I've ever met in my life, you know, just struggling with a disorder. And uh, it opened my mind. It allowed me to understand, like, the world is a much bigger place than what was between my ears. And, um, you know, it, it helped me to better serve more people and uh, understand how, how much of a change that I could actually inflict upon the world as one person. You know, and every every step that I've taken, you know, from mental health back into substance use, into prevention, you know, from treatment to prevention and now into a role where, you know, I'll, I'll probably have a lot more uh, decision making power, I guess I'd say. Right. Um, I think that the most important piece to bring with me is humility. Right. To understand that I don't know everything and I never will. And that, you know, everything that I want to do, every every suggestion or step that I make is because I want to better improve the systems of care and what we do, right? And to ultimately provide the best service possible. And I've had some great, great supervisors, great, um, you know, individuals in my life, um, mentors like yourself being one of them. Um, to really help guide me in a way that, uh, you know, I, I don't know I'd be where I am if I didn't have that. And, um, you know, again, I said it, I started with it. I will say it again. Like, I, I'm just extremely grateful for where I am. And my light went out again. So there we go. <laughs> right. And, you know, you have shared a lot with us this evening. And I know that some social workers have been having a conversation here. Um, there is a statement, um, she experienced 
some of what she discussed today during uh, her internship. And she was very, in capital letters, surprised. And this was in 2016. Mm. And uh, then the other social worker uh, wrote, um, yeah, raising the awareness has been saving lives. And we all should have a responsibility to raise that awareness. And uh, so I also acknowledge the this very nice comment about me. <laughs> and, uh, the university is so privileged to have you, Professor Owl. And I feel really privileged also to be in the, uh, to be here at the University of Delaware uh, that has given me the opportunity to just create. And um, I told you, Michael, that I will be tapping your brain and um, I will, you know, we have a deal that I, you, you are ready to drive to Delaware anytime I want you. I want, right. you to, <laughs> yes, I want you to come and do a big continuing education. True, true statement, true statement. <laughs> Correct. So, yeah, come and do a big continuing education conference uh, after you settle down. Our state needs that. We are a small state in need of uh, your expertise. And my students will be very happy to meet with you as well. And so I look forward to that. And, be an honor, uh, absolutely. Right. So the final question, you are taking on a very, very big job. And I know that you are the man for that job. What are you looking forward to? And how do you expect to take care of yourself um, while you're doing all of that big role? Um. I mean, what I what I'm looking forward to, and 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 what I expect, um, you know, I I think what I've learned, you know, kind of tying into the last question that you asked is that um, I learned not to have expectation. Um, I've learned to actually go into situations and observe significantly um, and say very little in my early on going of the of the position because. Um, I want to learn. I want to learn what's going on there. I want to learn what's right. Um, I want to pay attention to what people are doing well so that I can continue that. And then my addition is really to just add, right? Just to enhance. And, and that's all I ever really want to do is to enhance and then hopefully at that point, be able to gain the respect for of the individuals who work under me and uh, understand that I'm there. I'm just part of the team, right? And that's, and, and I like being just part of the team, you know, uh, because I, I firmly stand by the, the comment that I don't know everything and I wanna learn more. And, um, and, and I think by bringing that ideology to any organization, I think that, you know, regardless of what your position is, um, we all play a major role in making that organization successful. And, and I try to inspire people to bring out the best version of themselves um, and really get in touch with why they're in an agency, right? Why they do the work that they do. Um, and, and really from that point, help grow the agency even, and even bigger so that we can affect change on a grander scale. Um, and how I take care of myself, quite honestly, uh, you know, I'm in two baseball leagues right now. <laughs> um, you know, I, I like to remain active. Uh, you know, it's interesting, Think people think that because I do as much as I do that I go home and I'm tired, but I'm not. I actually am looking for more things to keep myself busy with. Uh, you know, I go to the gym, I do all the, the self-care is very important. Um, you know, I spend time with my family. My daughter, as I spent, said before, she'll be graduating from college herself next semester. So, um, you know, I I just, I, I enjoy life, you know, and um, I understand that, you know, what I do for a living, you know, the, the great thing is, and I think you've said it to me, and of course, it's an old saying that many people have said, but if you do what you love, you never work a day in your life. And I truly feel that way. You know, I, I love what I do. I love my work. Um, 
I'm still passionate and I always, you know, I, I can, can't foresee it not happening. And if it ever does, I'll probably change careers <laughs> because I don't want to be miserable. But, um, you know, it's it, it's easy for me to go to work and do this. You know, it really is. Uh, it, it's it's why a lot of the things have been accomplished, you know. And uh, again, uh, gratitude is is the, the only thing that comes to mind when I think about you know what what I have. So you know that's it's it's what it is. Right. Please tell Deja hello, and um, I will. <laughs> she, I am really really proud of her. Uh, and uh, she's but... she's in the next office over. She's she's running the 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 youth clubhouse <laughs> that we opened. So really wow. Yeah. Yes, uh, she is. And just to think that she's about to graduate from college, you know, I am really proud of her. But it's also a testament to uh, how great a father you are, all of that dedication. And uh, you even indoctrinated her as a Mets fan. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I don't know, but I hope not. I hope you haven't made her a Cowboys fan. But... Um, she likes she likes the Packers actually. So yeah. right, okay, <laughs> so that's good. <laughs> uh, but uh, hello, I want just one more semester to her graduation from uh, college. I really, uh, I'm so proud of her, proud of you. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, we also have a deal that if you, when you don't fly to Washington D.C., if you decide to drive and you're up 95. I'll yes. be waiting here unless absolutely I, unless you don't let me know before you make that <laughs> trip. <laughs> so, right. <laughs> so otherwise, make sure you stop over. Understood. Um, Will thank do. You, thank you. Thank for you. Your time, and I wish you very well. You know. Uh, you as well. Take care. I appreciate it. Take care. Bye bye.